Good morning. I trust you've experienced worshiping him this morning. Let's give the Lord a big hand today. We are to thank Jesus with our all. We're to thank him with our everything. He's good and he's good all the time. Y'all agree with that? Say this with me. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. What a way to start to start the morning, worshiping him with all of our heart. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. We've been on a series. This is our third week, and we're talking about the I Ams of Jesus. Week one was, I am the resurrection and the life. That was the Easter sermon. And then week two is, I am the good shepherd. We talked about that last week, how he was the good shepherd. And today, we're going to talk about, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Say light. light. I am the light of the world. John eight twelve says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. How many of y'all have been afraid of the dark at least one time or the other when you were a kid or something? Anybody afraid of the dark? I was. When I was a little kid, I was scared to death of the dark. I remember being in the house, and I always thought the boogeyman was in the closet. And if he wasn't in the closet, he was under the bed. So I'd have my mom, she'd come check, she'd look under the bed, she'd look in the closet, then she'd say, just stay in there, and I'd say, would you please leave the light on, at least a night light? And I was so afraid that I knew even with that light on, the boogeyman was still under the bed, and I was afraid at in the middle of the night to let my arm or my leg go off of the bed because he was there waiting on me. I was afraid. And then, and then, my grandkids are the same way. I'm doing the same thing for them. I go in there and I check out their closets. I leave the light on in my office. I always leave the lights on for them so they can see. Many times we're afraid of the dark. Well, Jesus brought good news to us. He says, I am the light of the world. You don't have to be afraid of the darkness that's around you. How many of you would agree this morning that there's a lot of darkness going on around us? Let me see your hands. Would you all agree with that? A lot of darkness in the world that we see. A lot of bad things going on. A lot of bad things happening to good people. But we see all kinds of of dark things going on around us. Well, enough for the gloom and doom. The good news is Jesus is the light of the world. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the good shepherd. And in him, there is no darkness. Again, he says, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. That means we won't have to be afraid of the darkness. Regardless of what's going on around us, what we're going through, what our kids are going through, what our parents is going through, what the what every, everything that's going on all around us, we don't have to be afraid because God is on our side. Well, in the book of Acts chapter 26 and verse 17 and 18, Jesus sent, he speaks words to the apostle Paul to contrast the difference between light and darkness. He talks about the difference in light and darkness. God is light and then Satan the Prince of Peace, was known as darkness. Well, in Acts chapter 26, the Bible says, Yes, Jesus is talking to Paul here, and the Apostle Paul writes, Yes, I am sending you, Paul, to the Gentiles. In verse 18, it says, To open their eyes. Say eyes. To open their eyes. See, back then and today, Many of us are living in darkness, but Jesus was aware of the situation, and he sent Paul to go and tell the people that he, they needed to open their eyes up. He, they needed to call attention to the things that was going on in their life, the things that was going on around them, the sins that they were struggling with. How many of y'all would say, honestly, this morning, you struggle with at least one sin? Let me see your hands. Everybody in here struggle with at least one sin? Wow. Some of you don't. Well, anyway, I struggle with one or two or a whole lot more, okay? Huh? So anyway, Paul, the Apostle Paul, he goes and writes in Acts chapter 26. He says, yes, Jesus says, yes, I'm sending you to the Gentiles so they will open their eyes because they were living in darkness. So they may turn from the darkness. Now he's wanting them to turn around. He's wanting them to do a shift. He's wanting them to turn to the light from the power of Satan to the power of God. Say the power of Satan, power of Satan to the power of God. Not focusing on the darkness, but now focusing 
on Jesus, who is the light of the world, who we have hope in. One of the greatest stories I've ever read in the Bible was the story of the woman caught in adultery. And this is the passage right before where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And we're going to start by looking at John chapter 8. If you would, please take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 8 with me. If you have a Bible or your iPhone or whatever it may be, and also we will shoot it up on the wall also. But this story here, the lady was caught in adultery, and it's a great significant story because all of us has been caught in one thing or the other, and all of us has struggled with one thing or the other. So again, we can relate to this story. And what we're going to be talking about is three different things right now this morning. One is the law, the law, the other is the love, the other is the light, being that Jesus is the light. Well, first of all, we're going to talk about the law a little bit. The law reveals our guilt. Say guilt, 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 guilt. The law reveals reveals our guilt. Well, when I look at John chapter 8, verse 2, it says, At dawn, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts. He appeared again in the temple courts, where all of the people gathered around him. And he sat down to teach them. And I think what the passage how we can relate here, it was early in the morning, it says at dawn, and all of the folks was coming to church. They was coming to listen to Jesus. They was coming to hear what the teacher, the master teacher, would say to them. Jesus came to teach them. He came to bring a very important message. It says, though, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They'd, they made her stand before the group. They made her stand before the group, and they said, Jesus, teacher, this woman is caught in the, the act of adultery. Now, back then, and from what I'm gathering from the people who wrote the commentaries and all as I researched this, back then, this lady was caught in adultery, and you noticed it was kind of double standards. They didn't bring the man in. It's kind of like when you send your teenage boys out and you say, hey, you know, don't be messing with the girls, and then you've got one standard for them, then you've got another standard for the girls, and you'll tell the girls, well, you better not do this, that, or the other. You got me? Well, back then, they had double standards. They didn't bring the guy in that she was caught with. This was very, very early in the morning, and as, they, as, as I've done some of my research, they could have brought the lady in. They just basically drug her out of one house into the front of the church. She might not have even been clothed, just wrapped a towel around her or a blanket or something else, but they humil humiliated her extremely. They brought her down. They threw her out in the middle of the floor, and they said, Look at this woman here. This woman was caught in adultery. And Jesus, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Verse 5, in the law, in the law, say in the law. In the, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, how about the guy? What do you think about that? No equal rights here, right? How about the guy? He's left. Nobody says anything about the guy. But it says, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? They're asking Jesus. Now, again, they're bringing them. It's as if they got the lady. They brought her out here, threw her in the middle of the floor. They're bringing her in front of Jesus, and they're saying, Now, Jesus, what do you want to do about this? They're disrupting the whole church service because they were focusing on the sin of this woman. They were focusing on her sin. They disrupted the whole crowd. They drugged the woman in front of Jesus. They said, look at this woman. Look how bad this woman is. And now Jesus, master, teacher, savior of the world, what are you going to do about it? What do you have to say about it, Jesus? And verse 6 says, now they were using this question as a trap. Say trap. They were using it as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing Jesus. Well, first of all, according to the law, she is guilty. She's guilty, right? But guess what? According to the law, all of us are guilty. Y'all believe that this morning? Now, that's not a message that we like to hear because people will say, well, I'm good. I'm really not that bad. 
Well, Jesus says there's no one good, not compared to his standards. We might be good people. We might help people out. We might be pretty good old folks. But none of us are as good as Jesus. Y'all believe that this morning? And see, people struggle with that. They'll think, you know, I don't cuss and I don't chew and I don't hang out with those who do. So they're okay. But the Bible again says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we all need Jesus. We have a need for a Savior, each and every one of us. If we didn't sin, we wouldn't have needed a Savior who came and died on the cross for each and every one of us. So again, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So according to the law, she's guilty, she's, she's sinned. And in the Jewish customs that this was in the top three of the sins adultery top three of the sins so what are they going to do they're going to stone her now jesus they're trying to trap jesus because one if jesus agreed he's going to lose his reputation for being loving and forgiving do y'all know about the love of christ how jesus gives us his grace each and every day how he forgives us of our sins well if Jesus agrees, if, if Jesus agrees, he could lose his reputation for being loving if he allows them to stone him. That's one scenario here. Then if Jesus forgives her, they're going to say, well, this is one of the top three sins. Jesus is condoning this adultery from the woman. He's breaking the law of Moses. Wow, Jesus breaking the law of of Moses. And again, keep this in mind. We have all broken the law at least one time. Everybody in here. You got me? Everybody has broken the law at least once. Everybody has sinned. The law reveals our guilt. If I ask you a question this morning, I'd say, hey, raise up your hand if you've lied before. Raise up, raise up your hand if if you've stolen something before, raise up your hand if you've lusted after somebody just a little bit. If you've used God's name in vain at least once, raise up your hand. And I'm not going to ask you to do that. But I remember all of these, and I can put my finger on times when I've seen people doing this. I've played golf with people. I know soccer moms. I went to a football game. I'm sitting here beside this nice lady that was in my church, and she was two rows over. We're at a football game, and the coach called the wrong play for her son, and the first things that she jumped up out of the stage, and it was the bad word, the mother words. It was using God's name in vain, and I'm sitting there going, wow, this football game brings out the best in us. And I wouldn't have expected it from her. This was in Indiana. It wasn't anybody here. Her name was Miss Coble, and it was Jeff's mom. And I'm sitting there going, wow, man, she can cuss better than any sailor I've ever heard, you know? But it was coming out. And you know what? Yeah, she's one of the best people I've ever met in her life. She was a neighbor of mine, great lady. All of us have sinned. See, unless we see ourselves as sinners and we admit to our sin, we will not see the need for a Savior, and all of us needed a Savior. Again, the law, it reveals our guilt. Now, the love, the love, let's go to that slide. The love reveals God's grace. It reveals God's grace. See, I like to preach about grace. God's grace is God's unmerited favor for each and every one of us. We don't do anything to deserve it. He just gives it freely because he loved us that much. Do you know God sent his one and only son? that whoever shall believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know that? God sent Jesus, his one and only son, that, our, that he has enough grace to forgive us of anything, and his tender mercies are renewed on a daily basis. Now, if I go back to John chapter 8, verse 6, part B, it says, but Jesus, he bent down and he started writing on the ground. You notice Jesus didn't start, stop and give them an immediate answer. How many times when people come to us do we feel that we've got to give somebody an immediate answer over a situation that we're in? We've got the whole church. Everybody's listening. You've got Jesus up front. They have came in. They threw the woman out. They're wanting an immediate answer from Jesus. Jesus, he just stopped and he didn't say anything. You know, the Lord gives us two ears to listen with and one mouth to talk with. I think Jesus looked. 
He listened. He observed. He did what the master teacher him could only do, and he knelt down. Jesus bent down, and he started to write on the ground with his finger. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, later manuscripts say, says that it was the sins of the accusers, the folks that brought her and threw her down. He started saying, well, maybe they've used the Lord's name in vain. Maybe they fudged on their expense account just a little, just a little. Maybe they've treated, cheated the IRS. Hey, just a little. You know what I'm talking about? Huh? None of y'all know what I'm talking about, I'm sure. You don't seem too receptive to this message. Maybe, maybe Jesus just knew everything. Maybe one of them that brought him in would backbite about everybody else. Maybe one of them was lying and Jesus is just sitting there going, hmm, right there, that one, he lies. This one backbites. This one's a gossip. Oh, this one's been cussing like a sailor here, you know? Huh, what did he do? He wrote on the ground with his fingers. He wrote on the ground with his fingers. See, Jesus is God in the flesh, and he knew everything anyway. Y'all realize that? He knows everything anyway. John chapter 8, verse 7, when they kept on questioning him, Jesus is sitting here writing in the dirt. Church folks, church folks, religious leaders, board members, I don't know who they were, you got me? But they were the religious folks. They were the law keepers. They were the ones who wrote the laws and had enforced the laws. Maybe they were the Bible patrollers. I don't know what they was. But when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, because you already knew, let any one of you who was without sin, say without sin. Let any one of you who was without sin throw the first stone. Wow. Hmm. Without sin. That's a, that's, a big, that's a big one there, without sin. See, when I sit back and relate to that, it's easy for us to look and see the outside sins of other folks around us. Y'all know what I'm talking about there? We can look and we can say, ah, oh, look what my neighbor over here did. Look what my neighbor over there did. Or look what my family member did over here. Wow, did you see how big that was? See, we can see the outside appearance of everybody else, but you know what? Jesus could see their heart. Maybe these folks, maybe these religious leaders, they look good on the outside. Maybe they showed up at church seven days a week. They showed up at the temple gate seven days a week to worship, but they had heart and hard and darkened hearts. He could see their hearts. He knew where they were at spiritually. Jesus knows where we're at spiritually. He knows if we have a heart that loves him. I can relate back to King David if I'm thinking about him. Y'all remember King David? King David did a lot of stuff. He took Bathsheba, had her husband killed, you know, took her, had a baby by her, adultery, all of it. But yet he repented and came back to God. And you know what God remembered him as? And people remember him as today? If we talk about David, what do we talk about David being? Man after God's own heart. You know why? He's seen the need for a Savior. He's seen the need for a Savior. My question to you today, do we see the need for a Savior? Do we see the need for a Savior? Regardless of what David did, regardless of how many times David messed up, one, two, three, four, five, and the outside things that we've seen David do and heard about him doing back in the Scriptures, and we've heard about our neighbors doing, and we've seen what our neighbors have done, regardless what everybody else has done, God looked and he's seen his heart. He was a man after God's own heart. Verse 8 says, and he stooped down and he wrote on the ground, at this, at this, those who heard began to go away. Say at this, at this. You know why? At this, at this, the rest of the folks are going like, ah, I got issues myself. Ah, say issues. The other folks are saying, mm. at this, verse 9, at this. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only who was left? Only Jesus was left. He's the only one who hadn't sinned, correct? Uh, guess what? With the woman still standing there. The woman still standing there. She's still there. Her and Jesus is left. Verse 10 says, Jesus straightened up and he asked her, Woman, where are they? Say, woman, where are they? Jesus straightened up and he asked her, 
Woman, where are they? Now, whose benefit's that for? You think Jesus knew where they was at? Huh? Jesus knew they was all a bunch of sinners. They all messed up one time or the other. He knew they had got guilty, and they got up, and they got out of the way. Jesus asked the woman, where are they? You know what? This was for the woman's benefit. I think Jesus come up beside of that woman, and he wrapped his arm around her, and he loved her. And he said, where are all of your accusers? Guess what? They're just as bad as you are or worse. You realize you've got issues? Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Has no one condemned you? This was for the woman's benefit. A broken, humiliated, shameful woman. He says, this is for your benefit. Has no one condemned you? And what'd she say? Verse 11, no one, sir. She said, Nobody else. Everybody else is gone. Then look, look, look what the Master Savior here says. Ne then neither do I condemn you. Say, neither do I. Then neither do I condemn you. See, when we've asked God for forgiveness, He don't condemn us. He gives us a new start. He gives us a new beginning. That's one of the most grace-filled words in the Bible, in history. One of the most grace-filled stories in the Bible. See, by God's grace, by God's grace, this woman was healed that day. A broken, beaten down, beat up woman, by God's grace, she was forgiven, she was healed by God's grace. God, Jesus was telling her, you're not, don't worry about what everybody else is saying about you, because through me, you are healed. You are forgiven. Others accuse you, but don't worry about it. Revelation 12, Revelation 12 says Satan is the accuser. He always wants to bring to attention what we've done, our past, right? Satan will tell us no one loves you. Satan reminds you of your past, all the times that you messed up. I'm sure old Satan, he was right all over David every time David messed up, telling David, you can't be the king anymore. You've committed adultery. You've sinned. You've had Uriah murdered. You are no good to anybody. But yet, we must remind Satan of his future. We've got to remind Satan of his future. When people's telling you you're not good enough and you messed up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, up to a hundred, whatever it may be, a thousand, you've got to say, God is for me, so I don't care who was against me. If God is for me, it doesn't matter who's against me. That's what the woman said. The woman who was so humiliated, she had so much shame. Jesus spoke for her benefit. Jesus straightened up and he asked, Woman, where's all of your accusers? Has no one accused you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus isn't here to, he's not here to condemn us today. He's here to accept us and forgive us. He's here to accept us and forgive us. Jesus told her she was forgiven. Now, he didn't make excuses for people. I understand that. Jesus did not make excuses for people. He didn't come out and say, I understand, ma'am, that's just the way you are. He didn't, under, he, he didn't say, I know your dad didn't love you, so you're searching for something else for different men. He didn't say any of that. He didn't say you're always going to struggle with lust or you're always going to overeat or you're always going to gossip or you're always going to overspend. No, he didn't say that. Jesus said, John chapter 8, Verse 11, Jesus declared to her, go now, say go now, and leave your life of sin. Say leave your life of sin. See, Jesus told her when she came to him, she was all messed up. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. He tells her to stop doing what she's doing and move forward. Folks, if we're struggling with something, we need to stop doing what we're doing. We need to take the words of Jesus himself. Go now and leave your life of sin. Take that new start. Take that new beginning. See, the law reveals our guilt. The love reveals God's grace. The law reveals our guilt. The love reveals God's grace. Mm.
Jesus declared, go now and leave your sin. Urgent. If you're trapped in darkness, if you've got a secret life, maybe if you're struggling with materialism, pornography, anger, unforgiveness, whatever it may be, whatever sin you're struggling with, Jesus is saying, go, leave your life of sin. He's saying, stop sinning. He's not saying yield to it. I can relate to this story. Many of you have heard it. I'm living up in Indiana, and I've got to preach that morning. I just moved into a new house, and I got up and got in the car, and I was going to be the first one there, and I pulled out of the driveway and get to the first stop sign, the second stop sign, and I did a rolling stop. Y'all know what a rolling stop is? It said stop, but I just kept getting it. First sign, second sign. Then there was a stoplight out there at the end, and one more stoplight in the city. After the only stoplight in the city, I looked back and seen a Ford Taurus, and it was blue lights flashing. I pulled over, and the guy says, uh, yeah, I'm your new neighbor. You're the pastor up here, aren't you? And I'm sitting there going, oh, my stars. Yeah. He said, well, I'm the police chief. He said, I live two houses down from you. Welcome to the neighborhood. <laughs> I'm sitting there going, he said, did you stop for any of them stop signs? And I'm sitting there going, which ones? He said, how about the lights? I said, well... Would you go for a rolling stop at this time? He said, you got to preach this morning? I said, yeah. I said, nah, I was in a hurry. i got to get to church first. He says, I'm going to give you a warning. He said, rolling stops and yielding is not the same as stop. Stop means stop. Say stop means stop. When God calls us to stop, he told the woman to stop and go the other way. That's what we got to do. I hate to admit stuff like that, you know? I hate to admit stuff like that. puts me on the spot, you know? But he let me go. That was a good thing, you know? Me and him became friends. The good thing about that, too, the judge lived back behind me, and I didn't even know that. So it was a good neighborhood. Good thing about that, all the church, all the work at the church got done by the kids on the work release. I had the biggest youth group ever was. Every time they'd get in trouble, I'd bring them to the church. They'd mow the grass. They'd paint it. They'd do everything, you know? I had, it was good to be friends with the chief of police and the judge. We all became buddies just for me running two or three stop signs than two stoplights. But anyway, yours might not end up that well. Trust me. Stop. When God tells us to stop, we need to stop. We need to stop. The law reveals our guilt. The love reveals God's grace. And last but not least, the light reveals our hope. Say hope. The light reveals our hope. Our hope is in the Lord. Verse 11 says, Go now and leave your life of sin. And now take this life that's full of hope. Take the life that's full of hope. I want to go back to John chapter 8, verse 12. Then Jesus says, He spoke again to the people, and He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never ever walk in darkness, but they will have the light of life. Notice here, Jesus did not condemn that woman, and he didn't beat her up while she was already down. Y'all know what I'm getting to there? When you see somebody that's fallen, don't beat them when they're down, and don't kick them when they're down. Forgive them and allow them to move forward. Because with Jesus Christ, we have a life of hope. The light reveals our hope. When Jesus said, I don't condemn you, he meant, she was forgiven. He said, I don't condemn you. I'm the light of the world. You've got hope in me. You've got a new start. You've got a new beginning. See, he was the light of her world that day. And to me, my prayer is this morning, I hope he is the light of your world. I hope that when you was lost, that one day you met a man named Jesus. That's what church is all about. That's what the gospel is all about. It's about life change. Once I was lost, it was about 20 years ago, and he found me at the end of May. At the end of May, about 20 years ago, I accepted him into my life, and he gave me a brand new start. He gave me a brand new beginning. John 12, 46 says, I have come into the world as light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Nothing gives hope like the light of the world. Nothing gives hope like the light of the world. The light always defeats the darkness. Say light. Say light. Always, always defeats darkness. Defeats darkness. The light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. He always defeats darkness. 
I've been struggling with a couple rats. They're out in my building out back where we keep our toys. And I go out there, and them vermins is always going around in there when it's dark. But if I leave the lights out, the doors open, I eventually got rid of them. They live and stay where it was dark. I don't know why they liked it where it was so dark, but they would stay in there. When we get in our sins, we like it where nobody can see us and when it's nice and dark. But when the doors are open, the light does what? Exposes darkness. So now I've got rid of my mice problem or, or rat pro problem, whatever you want to call it. We've got the doors open and the lights on in there, and now they're gone. Light always exposes the darkness. The light defeats darkness. Malachi, Malachi, I'm sorry, Micah, Micah 7, 8. Micah 7, 8 says, do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise again. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Who's he saying will be my light? The Lord will be my light. The Lord will be my light. Let's pray. You bow your heads for a moment. Close your eyes, please. Father God, today we thank you for your word. We thank you for the hope, Jesus, that we have in you. In you there is no darkness. God, you so loved the world that you gave your one and only son, Jesus, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God, today we're a bunch of strugglers here in your church. We need you to come into our heart come into our lives, not just on the outside, but on the inside and start cleaning us up. God, we got issues many, many times, and we need you. This lady here that was thrown in front of the church folks, she had a few issues. We're not denying that. Neither did you. You didn't deny it, but you said, I will accept her just like she is, and I'm going to forgive her, and I'm going to give her a brand new start, and I'm going to give her a brand new beginning. And the only thing I'm going to tell her to do is move forward and stop doing what she did before. If you're struggling in an area of life this morning and you just want to turn it over to God and say, God, I'm tired of struggling with this, and I want to give it to you right now just like the woman did, would you just raise up your hand so I can pray for you? Amen, amen, amen. I see your hands. Amen, I see your hands. Amen, amen. Father God, today we are your people. We come humbly before you to ask you, to forgive us of our sins, to give us a brand new start, to give us a fresh batch of your mercy, fresh batch of your grace. Give us a new start from this day forward. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. And all of God's children said, Amen, Amen, Amen.